is recording. Uh -huh. All right. Okay, so um, I have prepared what I think is quite a bit. So it may be that I'll skip things. And, uh, I certainly will try to be relatively uh, complete. So if something isn't clear immediately, uh, in the best case, it will be clear a little later. But if it goes on for a while and there are really perplexing things, obviously interrupt because I don't want it to be uh, obscure. OK, so <clears throat> Miller has this terrific idea of dealing with the voice as an instrument. I don't know whether he had actually in his title had as a musical instrument, but let's say <laughs> as an instrument of communication. So it seems to me that the voice is the most powerful mode of musical communication for the simple reason that it's evolutionarily uh, imperative. Right? We have grown as a species by being able to speak to each other. And that communication, of course, is on the one hand um, explicit and informational. Really sorry, I'm oh. one of the key things. Oh, OK. Well, this on you somehow. Together voice. So shall I wind up again? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So I have a lot of things that I want to say today, and you are welcome to interrupt at any point where the logic or um, other uh, aspects of the message are not uh, clear. Um, so I wanted to start off by saying that I think that the voice is uh, an instrument of communication, and it's the most powerful instrument that we have for the uh, clear reason that it's evolutionarily uh, necessary and we have exchanged information, some of it explicit, that is uh, uh, designating uh, particular ideas or particular events or objects in a specific way, but it's also inferential. So the, the voice has the capacity to change the meaning of explicit statements in terms of how those explicit statements are delivered. I think that's one of the great aspects of uh, Western song, is this capacity to hold in one medium both a message and the shaping of the message. And I think maybe not enough attention has been given over the years to the shaping aspect of it. So we are obviously attuned to the voice. We're attuned to it acoustically. We're attuned to it rhetorically and we'll return, we're attuned to it spatially. It makes a difference where it's coming from. And uh, that, of course, involves, to some degree, the uh, famous uh, fight or flight uh, aspect of uh, spatialization and the way we experience it as human beings. Various musical instruments in various cultures of all times, I think, have had the primary uh, physical character of dealing with inertia and dealing with resonance. So how long something lasts and as it persists, uh, what kinds of changes excite the resonance structure of that body in different ways. And of course, in terms of the voice, we have this immensely flexible uh, vocal cavity structure, and we have the glottis, which gives a signal uh, that the vocal cavity treats. And in some of the work that I've done, I actually look at that in, a, in an extremely elemental way. And in fact, the first piece that I'll talk about uh, deals with glottal fry. Um, in any case, uh, I think that the primary issues in terms of, let's say, the instrumentality of the voice are range, how high can it go, how low can it go, agility, how rapidly can it change from one state of production to another, and also duration, of course, how long can it continue to do things, either within a single breath or in terms of 
just uh, physical persistence. How long can we go on doing something? In my work, I've tried very much to always avoid making the vocalist uncomfortable because, um, well, partially I'm not sadistical, but uh, on the other hand, I also realize that to the degree that you abuse the instrument, uh, you get less out of it. So I don't think it makes a lot of sense to do things that, uh, let's say, use registral extremes that provide difficulties for the singer or the vocalist. And I think in that case, for example, of uh, Feldman's Not I, an opera for a single voice in which I think that it, it goes on probably three quarters of an hour, something like that. And it's almost always in uh, the G sharp above uh, the, the treble step. And that is a very unpleasant note for most soprano voices. And he stays on that note relentlessly and it creates part of the impact of the piece, I think. Um, I wouldn't do such a thing, but I'm aware of the possibility of these things. Also, of course, this matter of agility, upward and downward jumps, skips, and especially skips or leaps in succession, I would try to avoid. I try to give the voice a rest from time to time, particularly if it's doing something very demanding. And I try to limit the periods during which it's doing extreme things. And that means, uh, as we'll see in just a moment, that certain things are possible through electroacoustic media, particularly fixed media, when you can record vocal behaviors and then stitch them together. But these things would be completely out of line uh, if you were trying to do it live. Uh, how many of you have heard the Diamanda Galas? So Diamanda was a student here uh, many years ago, and I was giving a course in extended vocal techniques. And <laughs> during the first class, we were all seated in a circle in a room without chairs. And I asked everybody to come to the middle of the circle and do something uh, with their voice, something extreme with their voice. And Diamanda stood in the middle of the room and said, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was, of course, completely hair-raising. Please stay near the front of the room, uh, maybe up there. Uh, uh, and so, you know, vocal behavior in some cases, I mean, uh, she's made a career, of course, of being extreme. And she was that way from the beginning. Um, I wonder whether her voice has actually persisted uh, with the same kind of quality that it had decades ago because of the way that it's been used. Okay, so that's a sort of little preliminary about the, my thoughts about the voice in general. So I'm going to just go through early, middle, and late uh, in terms of uh, my own work. I've done a lot of uh, work that involves the voice in different ways. I'm certainly not going to try to be complete, but I tried to uh, grab some things that I thought were particularly worthy of discussion, if not of uh, musical enjoyment. So uh, the first piece I'm going to talk about is the, uh, the Emperor of Ice Cream. And this is a piece that I wrote while I was a graduate student at the University of Michigan. And it was written for the Wentz Festival, but it was never performed there. Uh, and I had the idea, and you can uh, take a look at these, at these, um, <laughs> um, as, as we go along. Uh, I had the idea that uh, not only did I want to deal with what was happening over time in a sort of left to right, you know, uh, space equals uh, time and pitch uh, structure, but I wanted, if you turn the page on a 90 degree angle, I wanted to portray how the musicians were moving on the stage. So constantly throughout the piece, the eight singers and three instrumentalists are changing their position. And so the score, if you look at it uh, this way, thinking that time is up, then the events happen in such a way as to indicate where people are. So. Here's that same page in a slightly more legible uh, form. 
And you can see at the very left edge that there is a sort of uh, cluster of events, if you look at the middle of the page, that are by the second man, the first and third women. And after a while, with the dotted lines, the, all of these singers' initial positions change by the time that that first line occurs. And at that point, you have um, the, the, the top voices, male and female, singing together, and you have four other voices starting the, the C of call. So the, the extension of all is <coughs> portrayed by the duet at the top, and the ka is done by the four singers that are together slightly left of center, the stage. And at the bottom, you have the bass saying, call the roller a big cigar. So the, the uh, contours of the voice, uh, as portrayed in the score, are what suggest want you to stay as close to the front as possible. Aren't you? Okay. So uh, the idea is that the, that the lines, uh, the vocal lines, whether sung on the stage or uh, in a sort of uh, relation to a three-line uh, implied uh, stage, uh, the shape, the extent, and the density of the words, the way they're portrayed, uh, tells the singer how to produce the sound. Is that, that's clear? Yeah. So there are a couple of things that I got interested in, and I got interested in them without actually realizing what I was doing. So on the first page, you can see that I got interested in the idea that there was the Wallace Stevens text. So it starts, call the roller of big cigars. And I realized that roller ruler uh, of big cigars could have another several kinds of uh, vocal phrases that would fit with it. So uh, instead of with big cigar, muscular, uh, I, have, I have muscular one, and I have you are one, and the single word musk. So there are, there are various kinds of uh, hom homonyms surrounding the primary uh, line. So the primary line throughout the whole piece is continuous uh, in terms of the explicit statement of a series of words that make up Wallace Stevens' text. But frequently there are, uh, frequently there are like outcroppings or densities that occur of different sorts. Sometimes the adding of percussive sounds, sometimes the adding of pitch information, sometimes instead of a single proclaimed line, it will become a group sung line, etc., etc. So the medium is constantly changing. <coughs> and this, this practice is called glossing. I didn't know that word at that time. But it's a very interesting thing to do with voices because you can get a primary line projected in terms of its meaning, and you can have these evanescent, slight implications of other kinds of meaning at the same time because of the parallelism of the, um, the actual audit auditory contact, content sorry, of each of these phrases or words that are going with the main one. <coughs> so it's a form of kind of timbral counterpoint. So another thing that I got interested in because of the idea of um, having the score indicate position on stage as well as the actions to be performed was to have some sort of uh, humanoid spatialization. So here's a, an example of that. So the line from Wallace Stevens is, and spread it so as to cover her face. So I took the, the informational uh, designation of spread and then I manifested spread by extending the line <coughs> and <coughs> sorry if you see the central uh, stave tells the shape of what's happening 
But who is actually delivering that depends upon those uh, rectangles that are spread between the different uh, singers. So if you look from top to bottom, you have the, the, the top, uh, I don't know quite how to do this, but the top female and the third male and the fourth female and the first male and so on are spread across the stage. Now what happens is that this, the first word that we have here, and, begins with the, the let's say, the second tenor, and then passes to the, the, the second alto. Spread begins with the, um, the, the, the top soprano, moves back to the uh, alto, and so on. So this is what it sounds like when you actually do it. I don't exactly know how I would describe the significance, but there's a significance of the differences between the voices, the male-female difference and the differences within the, the genders. Each voice has some kind of you know, identity, and that identity exists even in the part of a word. And that's something that interested me also in this, in this piece. I never actually got back to that. <coughs> so any comments or questions about that? Because I'm going to be moving fairly quickly. Does that mean that the piece was written for specific people then? Because wouldn't each individual bring no, that unique? No, it wasn't written for specific people. Uh, but <coughs> that was, and that's not something that I knew when I wrote it. Right. It's something I discovered when I heard this. Right. <coughs> Okay, so the next thing is uh, I did a group of pieces uh, shortly after I arrived at UCSD. I had been asked by the chairman because he knew I had had interaction with various foundations before I came here. <coughs> he asked if I would uh, try to initiate an organized research unit. And uh, the University of California has two forms of organization. One is departments of instruction and the other is organized research units. And research units are, generally speaking, they don't give courses, so they do research projects in the Lawrence Livermore Labs, for example, at the University of California are an organized research unit. Cal IT, too, is an organized research unit. And so I started this <coughs> organized research unit called the Center for Music Experiment and Related Research. And uh, one of the things that I worked on at, in that center, uh, there was a, a group of fellows, I won't go into the whole structure of the center, but there was a group of young uh, musicians, including actually Philip Larson and Ed Harkins were among the fellows at that time. Uh, and uh, they had a group called the Extended Vocal Techniques Ensemble. So I decided I was going to do a series of pieces called Voice Space, one word. And the idea was to find texts and to find vocal behaviors <coughs> and to try to integrate a kind of choreography of vocal character, position, and meaning, and sonic uh, 
identity such that a voice would move in space and every aspect of what it did would be kind of choreographically uh, controlled or guided. So the first thing that I did was to uh, uh, discover what it was that the various people in the ensemble could do. And it turned out that I was, I tried always, I always try to do everything that I ask anybody else to do myself. So I had been practicing <coughs> uh, global fry. I won't do that now because it will fill my voice even more than it already is. But um, I found out that Phil Larson could do this really, really well. And uh, <coughs> he could, in fact, control the rate at which he was clicking. So I made a score for him of exactly how I wanted the patterns of clicks to go in relation to the changing of the vocal cavity. So one of the, the first line in the piece is, the scene around was desolate. And so the fact is that if you think of the vocal cavity as a literal cavity, and you're pinging it with, uh, let's say, a laser burst, you're going to see a different aspect of the uh, cave every time you shift the position in which the strobe was sent. So the idea was that he would, he would illuminate the vocal cavity with his glottal pulses. And so we, we did all the recording for this <coughs> in the original uh, CME uh, building. And uh, we did it very late at night to avoid noises. And Philip would lie on his back on the floor and the microphone, something like this, we would put it in his mouth. So he, he would, it was optimizing, let's say, the signal to noise ratio. So here's a, a first phrase. <coughs> and just to see what I was working with physically, if you look down on a space and you assume in this situation that the ideal listener is pointing upwards, so that the top of each of these um, boxes is, in, in fact, the front speakers in a space. Right? Then at first, the glottal pulsing comes from the distant right and comes forward, settles on that, that speaker, in fact. And then as desolate starts, it moves out from the center, from, sorry, from the uh, rear left comes forward and moves around in the shapes that, that you can see there. So this is stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. Now obviously we're not going to hear that now because Miller um, advised me against relying on the multi-channel system set up. So this will just be stereo, but you'll, you'll get the idea.
so obviously <clears throat> that's not done as one live uh, event and the, the over pressure things are ingressive so it's uh, that kind of thing <clears throat> and uh, it was all sort of written out and we rehearsed it and so on and so on and <coughs> recorded it over a number of nights and uh, here's uh, one other that I really like section which uses fewer of the clicks and, and more of the uh, sort of glottal overpressure, aggressive screeching. And there was no spring. distance and polarity and dimensionality because of the immense range of its potential. So Philip, uh, I don't know where his capacities are right now, but he had an incredible falsetto that would go up as high as uh, uh, the F, the top line of the trouble stuff. And, and of course he can go down to the E below the bass clef. So I realized that there was a possibility of <coughs> using his chest voice alternatively with his falsetto voice. And uh, so I, I did a piece called The Palace. It's on a text by Borges. And palace is a metaphor for the human mind. And the idea is that the palace is infinitely varied uh, and you can't know it all, and so on and so on. <clears throat> and this is, of course, true of the mind as well as the metaphoric palace. <coughs> So the idea was that I would use a, uh, a pseudo language. And if you can see uh, at the very bottom on the left side, you see a phrase, we can take in some faces. Can you make that out? Okay, so you see just above that, te o -ake. And the idea is that the, that the chest voice sings pseudo words that have only consonant vowel consonant structure. And the falsetto voice above in the treble club sings words that only have vowel consonant vowel. So they they have a very you know strongly differentiated character, and I'm, and there's a drone that accompanies much of it, and various words that are circulated spatially and so on. And there are these two kinds of voice: the active voice uh, and the uh, inferential or the reflective voice. And so I'm just going to play a section from the piece that brackets this particular image. Fail. 
That's a live performance, so he he does all the singing, okay. going by jumping back. It's very funny because that's exactly the question that Zanakis asked me: Is that one voice doing that? Because he was very interested in this, and he wrote a piece at the same time uh, for a Greek singer named Spirosakas, mm -hmm. and that was uh, Ais, which Philip yes. did here with Steve Ship uh, at yes. one point. Anyway. Uh, yeah, and, and in the background, you hear the, the difference between the voice, which is what I call the active, and the voice, which is reflective. And for those uh, using the Stanford uh, processing strategy, we took the reverberation, which for the low voice had a 60 second decay time, and we just inverted it so that the, the voice that's reflective has a shimmer which has the same numerical structure of prime numbers, but is upside down. And that worked very nicely. Uh, so then, uh, I don't know, did you uh, tell them about the readings, or did they get that? Or, okay, so you know a little bit maybe about uh, justice. <clears throat> and uh, I have two scores, one is pretty messy, the other is less messy, but why don't we actually So, uh, before we get there, I wanted to just briefly uh, introduce you to another, I mean, much of what I'm going to talk about as you're hearing is making the voice, playing with the singularity and multiplicity of potential in a single voice. I'm also interested, of course, in the differences between single voices and choruses, because the the choric effect, which is a standard uh, psychoacoustical term, uh, you know, kind of uh, instantiates the notion that there is something extremely uh, clear and powerful and even slightly mysterious about the difference between a single violin and six. Or I think it's, we we found out actually from this actor experiment that we're involved with, uh, that when you add violins one by one, it's about six that begin to give you that choric effect. And less than that, it, it doesn't happen yet. Uh, I don't know if the same is true of voices. But I thought I would play you. Uh, I did this project uh, which of which justice is part of the outcome. It was intended originally to be an opera called The Red Act. Uh, and I finished the two halves of it, but I never actually put it together into a unified opera. So this first piece was written for the BBC Proms Festival, <coughs> and involved the BBC singers, and the BBC <coughs> orchestra, and a narrator, and a channel computer process sound. And the idea was that the chorus in general, if there's anybody who's particularly interested in that, I have the choral score but I, I don't have, uh, I didn't have a copy of the actual orchestral score uh, that I could get my hands on right away. Anyway, the point is that the, that you, you have uh, an eight part choir with four sections of women and four sections of men. 
and the line moves registrally constantly. So the people sing whose registers match with the register of the moving line. Okay? So generally speaking, the line is singular. It's unison, 2D singing. But whenever there's a particularly important word or phrase, then that spreads. It can, be, it can spread to a cluster, can spread to a, uh, to a harmonic uh, structure, and so on. So I'll just play a passage, just sort of arbitrarily, from the piece so you can hear the way the, uh, this idea of having a singular line which traverses a vocal resource that is gender divided and you know what happens when various forms of uh, emphasis are invoked. of course in the position of the various forces on the stage just as I was with the improvised cream as I pointed out earlier. I should mention also that there's a there's a, a theatrical aspect to the palace which we won't go into but this has to do with this issue of context the context within which a voice sounds or speaks is <coughs> to the way we feel about what it's saying. And so, uh, in the case of the palace, I have, uh, I try to create a situation where there's a kind of monolithic block, which is slightly off-center to the left, and Philip sits slightly off-center from that, too. It's as though he's behind some kind of a, of a desk or some kind of a, uh, it suggests kind of disturbingly authoritative uh, situation. And he's lit by two spotlights. One spotlight that's extremely intense that comes from the wings and illuminates half of his face in a rather brilliant orange. And then there's another light which is a kind of sickly green which comes from above. So when this light is off, you see this sort of cadaverous face, and when that light comes on, you don't see, of course, the, the, the green anymore, you just see the flaming. So that alternates with those active and reflective parts of the voice. So here, I was thinking about how that might uh, work in terms of uh, justice, and so this is just a sketch in which I was playing with like a six-channel system. Uh, <coughs> the, that's uh, in the upper left of the uh, picture, and then how the various percussion uh, percussion instruments would be displayed, uh, the positions of the uh, three performers on the stage and so on. 
the piece, as you now know, has a soprano, an actress, and a percussionist. They have <coughs> the function of you know, the, the actress delivers the articulate message, the soprano delivers the emotional or inferential message, and the percussionist is sort of the impulsive id. And uh, in, in a live performance, you hear it in a way that doesn't come through so much on the recording uh, because we did a lot of massaging of the voices in order to make sure that they were, uh, that, the, that the text was particularly clear and sharp and we couldn't do the same thing with the production. So this is uh, just a, a section from a notebook. I have a notebook in, in all the pieces that I do. And here I was looking at the idea of <clears throat> various forms of height and focus. And the, that's on the left side. The disjunction, exhortation, and persistence. So these are, let's say, dramaturgical, but also musical and uh, uh, vocal behavior cat categories. Right? Then below, extended production, agony, kiss, and song. So uh, I'm exploring, and if you see on the right-hand side, there's percussion, uh, actor, and soprano, and I'm just playing around with how the percussionist could accent certain, oh, child, who brought you to this death, uh, et cetera. And I'm just looking at the idea of how these three uh, portions of a single entity are to be treated. So I took the, the text from a fantastically good um, translation, I think, by a man named Richard, Richmond Lattimore. And uh, then this is not exactly as it appears, of course, in the, in the Bollingen uh, text. But I, I have not only parsed it according to the way I feel its units of meaning, but I've also broken it up, so you can see right under Clytemnestra, uh, I raised my cry of joy. It's, it's not I raised my cry of joy, but there is a break between. So I'm going to try to, to fracture those words, and then I have to figure out what I'm going to do because I have fractured them. If you look on the upper uh, right side of your uh, image, I feel no shame. So the no and shame are spread out and they're put in italics. So I'm thinking from this point that, that those words, those syllables, those uh, indicators, and the same with love just below it, will, will have some kind of an extreme character. And then further down, you see that that fractionization that happens under Clytemnestra on the right, I raise my cry of joy. Now it's going back and forth. The he had been cut full of gashes like a fish in net such. So now this is going to pass back and forth between the, the actress and the singer. Okay. <coughs> so now I, I go for each section and I, I, I write out the, the full text and then I start deciding what part will, will behave according to the different categories. So the first, I raise my cry of joy, is the disjunct category. Then the persistent category uh, follows. Uh, you see boxes around at night, and breaks, and howls, and breaks at night, etc. And those are the recordings that I made with the BBC singers, and then computer processed to make what I call 11 images. And those images are extended uh, in time <coughs> over their original form. And they're also complexified in a variety of textural ways with various kinds of algorithmic transformation. So those appear in the Red Act Arias, and they appear also in Justice, and they appear also in the other sort of final penultimate pair called Illusion, which was written for the L.A. Phil and Solomon. So here again, <coughs> I'm, I'm making sort of, sort of successive approximations, right, of what I'm going to do 
and each time I get on a page, whether it's from there or there or there, I know a little bit more about what I'm going to do. Then the last stage is quite explicit. So this is a particular Q3B or 38, and I'm looking at those places, no shame, <coughs> love, and so on, and deciding a little more specifically, in fact, quite a bit more specifically, how they're going to sound. <coughs> so, um, love, start word and have a reaction to it that requires a shriek, then a vibrating before it lets you go. So, that idea of the shriek of love and then and so on. So I'm looking at all those uh, those possible details, and then when I see down under the fractionated or the disjunct thing at the bottom system, I tell you, etc. My own true life, and I'm looking for now for not only behaviors but for numbers, groups of four, groups of seven, groups of three, and so on that I'm using as another kind of uh, of the uh, of the work. So um, what I'm going to do now is play. Uh, I'm going to jump out of this and do a little bit of a version that was done at the Library of Congress. Uh, I hope I can find this fairly quickly. From the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C.
you're, you're not in the room. Mm -hmm. So something happened. Oh, so go to like the most recent or something. It's a blank document, yeah. I think. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just a blank document. document. So you have to get into the right slides. Yeah. So but, it's, but it should when I but it's in a different Oh, I see. So I am mean, uh, Yeah, I think it's at the top. I think you could hear just a bit. One of the things that I want to uh, emphasize about this is that the voice of an actor has fully as much dimensionality, maybe even more dimensionality than most Western singers. Right. So I think you could hear what Donna does at that one place when she made a very kind of hissing sound as she moved across and a very, I don't know, touched with uh, menace, I'd say. And, and here's uh, another version done in Japan with the New York City Opera, uh, soprano Lauren Flanagan and uh, Suzuki Tadashi's main uh, actress, Hel Ellen Warren. And I just wanted you to hear, oops, I wanted you to hear the difference. Oh. Children need to clasp the angel who got them. 
Well, there are different. I, I, this raises really I mean, interesting. It's a different topic. It, it raises a really interesting point because, <clears throat> firstly, there are sections uh, that was like the place where I cut the first uh, video. Uh, there are maybe six or seven places in the piece that I call arias, and they're sung, and they're accompanied by vibraphone and, and so on, or or by computer sound. But one of the things, the first performances of this piece were done in Japan, not at the Library of Congress that, that commissioned it. And so I had this, I had Steve Schick playing percussion, and this incredible actress, Lauren Flanagan, and, I'm uh, sorry, uh, uh, Ellen Lauren, and Lauren Flanagan, the soprano. They come from three completely different worlds. The world of theater, the actor and actress is one thing. The world of operatic singing is another. And of course, the world of contemporary percussion playing is different. They could not get their act together. <laughs> and it was, it was the most uncomfortable experience that I've ever had in a, in a musical context. Because uh, the first performance was going to be Friday night. and. Saturday, uh, Thursday afternoon, about one or two o'clock, they all three of them were in different parts of the lobby, and uh, there was no even possibility of my like talking to them separately. I mean, things had gotten so intense that there was just nothing going to happen, and so finally, about I don't know five o'clock in the afternoon, they came in. And, and they performed it and you know, everything happened. But the thing that I realized is that the way that people come together is, is certainly uh, disciplinarily influenced 
And my guess is that the musical aspect of things, which is to say cults in one form or another, was the thing that kind of took over. And there, there is, of course, a pulse in, in, much of the, in much of the material, but certainly the majority of it is not pulsed. And there is no beat and there is no tempo and I would guess at least you know, 55, 60% of the piece. So the question would be, what do they lean on? And to some degree, of course, the, the structure of the whole piece is determined by the timings of the of the computer sound. But within that, within each of those uh, segments, they have to make orders somehow. So the question is, how do they do that? The score certainly shows timings <coughs> quite precisely. But I think the periodicity issue is probably more to do with the question of how they how they decided in the end that they could come together. And that might have not have been an intellectual thing. Okay. So I, did, I wanted to quickly get to the most recent thing that I've done, which is a, a piece for Steve Schick. I don't know how many of you might have seen that, so you know something about it. Anyway, it's called Here, Here, and There. And it's on a Beckett text and for a speaking percussionist. And it resulted from a two-year collaboration between Steve and me. And I realized from the beginning that it was going to be an extremely demanding piece. And so I, I kept saying to Steve as we talked about it to try things out, are you really sure that I should you know, pursue this? Or should we maybe rein it in a little? Part of that, uh, of course, comes from the fact that there is a, a very extended Beckett text, and to memorize the text is already a monumental task. And to keep the memory uh, clear with Beckett is particularly problematic because there's so much permutation. So the same kinds of things come back again and again, but they're never exactly the same. And of course, they aren't the same in terms of the meaning projected either. So uh, that, was, that was something that, that was uh, an important thing. I had to figure out at the beginning how to make the role that Steve was playing different from the role that, that an actor would, let's say, different from the way an actor would have approached the same issue. <coughs> So one of the ways, and this is, goes back to what you uh, just asked, was to set three tempos. A tempo that was normative, a tempo that was fast, and a tempo that was slow. And they had to be sufficiently different so that you would really feel the differences. So we played around with this a lot and ended up coming up with a slow tempo of 36, uh, a normative tempo of 84 and a fast tempo of 156, which was a ratio of 3 to 8 to 13. And so uh, part of the, the structure of this piece and part of the way that the performer organizes his or her uh, behavior uh, relates to those tempos, <coughs> having them in the mind, but not as fixed references, and we, we could, I'll show some specific places so you get the idea. So on the top of this page, this is the end of a section, and you can see that uh, there are three brackets on the left, and this is for primarily bass drum and tam tam. <coughs> and under each of the elements are words, which are sort of longhand brackets. So her, what, what, tomb, not certain, I'd have come out, etc. So what happens is that in each of those situations, the percussive writing emulates the text in some way. Either the meaning of the text or the sonic profile of the text becomes the stimulant for the writing of the percussion part. So then uh, in, in section F, he starts out with a normal, what I know where I came from, 
a single slash is a, a breath. A double slash is a meaningful st stop. <coughs> so it would start out, would I know where I came from? No. I'd have a mother, etc. Now, then I did, as you can see here, uh, as with justice that I just showed you, there are words that have um, a kind of extra delivery of emphasis of some sort. I don't define what the emphasis should be completely. So in this case, I, I suggest, because this is fairly early in the piece, that it goes from an aspirate to an ordinary or had, had, I'd have had a mother. So one of the things we discovered, little by little, is that those areas where there's a particular stress need to have skirts. So the idea that the, the production that you're going to emphasize has to have a kind of run up to the moment that is stressed and then die away. That was part of what Steve discovered in trying to realize this. So now this is an aria in, in the sense of this. So I, this, this is the whole thing. And, um, for some reason, my uh, crop function in, is not working, so I, I couldn't make small examples, so I just blew this up and it's kind of ugly. But, so if you look at the first bracket, if there was a way out. So the arias are defined by an extremely tight relationship between percussive sound and vocal production. So <clears throat> he starts out with if, and the bracketed f's means that he sustains the f, and then there's a scrape uh, that has cyclical function on the bass drum, then there's a significant pause, then there, and there are three kinds of vocalizations that are not words. One is uh, and one is and the other is uh. so there's alarm, there's like sorrow or relief, and there's uh, a gut punch. Kind of thing. So those are there too, and you can see how that evolved. So there was a way out. So he's saying. T -t 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 at the same time that he's striking the middle of the bass drum to the edge and then onto the rim. So M to E to R. And you know, below you can see the different ways. It's extremely intricate and obviously it took a very long time for him to uh, master all this and make it something that actually works. And so here's this same section. Would I know where I came from? No. I'd have a mother. I have had a mother. And what I came out of, what pain. I have forgotten. What does it make me say that? What is it makes me say <gasps> whatever it is makes me say all. And it's not certain. Not certain the way the mother would be certain. The way the two would be certain. If there was a way out, if I said there was a way out,
have a mother. I have a dream. How do I get out of here? One doesn't come out from here. So you can see the investment, and basically everything is notated. That he realizes different passages in different ways, but the movements and the different kinds of iterations, and whether he's using fingers or a hard or soft uh, agitator and so on, is all in the score. And this is, of course, largely things that I imagined, proposed to him, and then he said, yeah, that'll work, or no, that won't work, and we negotiate to find something that will uh, you know, serve the purposes that are set out. So, any questions? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I saw the performance, and it was just amazing, partly because you know, Steve turned out to be a great actor, right? Well, he, I mean, this is, you know, back to that issue of, of what's an actor and what's a speaker and, and who can do what. He worked with Philip. He worked with uh, Eva Barnes, who's the vocal teacher in the theater department. And he spent a long time. And we, you know, we rehearsed and, you know, adjusted and, you know, pointed out that certain things were just not working. And the, I mean, I just think it's uh, stupendous what kind of uh, commitment he put into, because he's, of course, done pieces with voice before, but never like this. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm curious, because um, I, I believe that the, 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 during the workshop, that the students, uh, participants were learning this piece, right? At the same time, yeah. So like, how did you find them? Like, you know, did you, did, did the, uh, at the end of the, the workshop period, um, did, you, did you find their results more or less like in the right direction, or? Oh, absolutely. No, everybody, uh, everybody, there were seven percussionists who came with the crosswire thing from Europe and uh, Latin America and this country. And, and they all worked uh, like 14 hours a day. And they had spent, they had had four months with the score before they came. And each of the groups was assigned a particular section so that there would be a group of people who would be describing, you know, working on the first. 10 pages and then the second 10 pages and so on. And uh, it, was, it was really interesting because the one thing that had concerned me a little was uh, how well would this adapt to a female voice? And there was just no problem at all. I mean, uh, four of the seven were, were women and they just, it was fantastic. Yeah, Alex? Um, I was wondering, it looks like you're showing a little bit of it here, but I was wondering about the station with the vibraphone and... Right. There were okay. crotales as well? No, um, no. Okay. So, okay, just quickly. Um, <clears throat> this text is very unusual for Beckett. In fact, as far as... I, I know a lot about Beckett, and I've used a lot of his texts in, in different works before, but I've never seen an upbeat ending in any <laughs> text. <laughs> But in this text, he, he goes towards Dante at the end, and he speaks about, you know, 
seeing the skies and the stars again and so on. I mean, in other words, he gets out. He finds a way out. And that's very unusual. So I realized in thinking about what I said at the very beginning, because a text, I think if you're using the voice and you don't have a text that you're, you're you know, wasting part of what the voice is. And secondly, if you have a text but you don't, the, the text isn't clear, you're wasting another part of what the voice is and can do. And so the, the issue of uh, how to, uh, you know, bring both this dimensionality, which was not a, an actor's uh, way, and, and yet something that was uh, uh, musically dimensional and so on, was really important. And so I was interested, obviously, in the meaning of the words, but I was also interested in the emotive resonances of the words. And I could not imagine setting those final <coughs> words in this text without pitch. It just, I couldn't see that could happen. So then I had to go backwards and find how do I introduce the vibraphone. I don't want it to be central, because the central thing is that complete simplicity of the circular tam that's vertical and the same diameter bass drum that's horizontal. And then there are also three uh, metal objects that, that are put on at various times. We didn't hear that. Um, Maybe we hear it in this last example. But uh, I had to then introduce that. And that came up because so much of the text has pairs, uh, now and then, here and there, and so on. So I just realized that the home base was here. And there was that other place that you considered going to. Right. So then there are three episodes that happen at the vibraphone. The first two, um, and, and in each three, they're radically different uh, mallets. So he plays with very, very soft mallets in the first one, with medium mallets in the second, with very hard mallets in the last. <coughs> and so it's meant to be like coming at you, as it were. And he doesn't, he doesn't use his voice at all in the first two. Well, there's a couple of moments. So in the last, he's really accompanying himself and that's something that hasn't happened before. Um, so did I lose the question? I probably did. No, no, I, I, I was just wondering about it because it was, uh, yeah, it was very striking to see him migrate to this other world. Of course, he had to do something while he was migrating. Yeah. So that's when we used, uh, let me just, uh, if we have time, uh, you know, we'll, uh, yeah. if you don't mind, I'd like to go quickly through these so you see again, I'm getting mixed, I must be getting mixed. This is the fast tempo. And there are rhythms on the bass drum that accompany some of these things. And, and then there's a, an instrumental passage, uh, which that the, the sort of flittering things here are guero uh, notation. So that the width is the loudness, the density is the speed, and the shaping is the degree to which the, the agitating uh, element is either, you know, as it were, near the, uh, near the, uh, what's the right word? The, uh, the bow? The frog. The frog. Uh, yeah, near the frog or near the tip. So the greater it gets to the tip, the higher the, the pitch, and the more it's to the frog, the lower the pitch, etc. So these are very explicit. And what happens here in the last one is that he's, the aria becomes a real exposition, <coughs> a real exposition of the parallels between the guiro realization of text and the voices. So this is the, the place where they come closest together. And I think you really learn, if you haven't learned it before, you learn how the guero can speak in this last section. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not 
there's a way out there. No. No! I must be getting mixed. I'm getting mixed. Confusing here and there and now and then, just as I confused them then. The here of then, the then of there, with other spaces, other Times dimly discerned, but not more dimly than now. Now that I am here, if I'm here and no longer. Steve more of, as acting more of uh, an actor, 
<laughs> well, uh, I'm, I'm mostly asking, it seems like you don't indicate uh, like pitch contour through his, oh. yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's interesting, and I, I would not have guessed either way listening to it the first time, uh, because I feel like the contour of the delivery has a lot to do with the interpretation of it, so the, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, well, the question becomes, in a, in a piece like this, which is, uh, it's not only demanding in terms of the performance requirements, it's demanding in terms of what you have to acquire before you can start to play it. Right. So you have to acquire a voice. You have to acquire a solution to the issues of where things will be yeah. and how your motions will allow you to pick up what you need at each moment and all the rest of that, which was not notated. So I think that what I decided was that the there was a limit to how much of the contour would be fair, as it were, to put. So it, this is not at all like, let's say, the Emperor of Ice Cream or, or other pieces that I showed you earlier, where the contour is very specifically um, specific. You know, it's very it's very specific. And, uh, for example, when Ellen Oren was doing the vocal part, she, unlike the actress at the Library of Congress, Ellen read the part. And every time she changed pitch, it was specifically what the score said. But, of course, it didn't mean what she made it mean, because there are all those intangibles that go into it. So, no, I didn't think, I mean, there are a lot of places that you saw there are these shaded things that go over. So that occurs, you know, fairly often in the piece. Uh, and that does suggest, uh, you know, pitch contour. But generally, I thought that was, it would have been just overload. You know, I mean, leave, leave some space for the accommodations that are needed um, in all kinds of ways, for all kinds of reasons. This is kind of a funny question, but was that the same bureau he used in the performance? Yeah. It was? Okay. Originally, we had two queeros, a small, uh, I, I wanted a, a sort of a small one, a, a treble one and a bass one, but it just turned out that this one could do everything. Because <laughs> <laughs> I remember it being more um, oval, but it was the same one. Okay. I mean, certainly some of the students used different words, as okay. most people brought their own, because it's a very personal aspect of the piece, and you've got to, and you've got to be able to manage it, and so people tend to bring their own world. So was your world notation personal to you, or have you seen it before? I'm curious if what, you invented what it. What part of it? Um, all the aspects that you talked about. So having the tick marks closer, like the width and then density. I, I don't know any of it. I mean, I've done it, and I did it in, in Justice uh, 20 years ago, so yeah. I've, I've done that a lot. But, I mean, the fact, the injustice, the importance of the Guero came because the Steve had a setup with a vibraphone and, and bass drum and all this, but he had to have uh, portable sound makers. So the claw base, there are seed pods, there are, you know, uh, maracas and various kinds of things. And the most powerful turned out, of course, to be the guero. And uh, I don't, you yeah. know, I mean, there are extensive parts, I didn't play any, but there are extensive parts of justice that have the same mm. aspects. You know, but it's um, so the Guero kind of reminds me of uh, Phil Larson's Galatas. Um, what does that tell us about the like the voice, the voice's function, I the aesthetics it, of the voice as an instrument? I think something. it reminds us that the voice results from a series, a train of pulses. And that that train can be very fast, and that train can be very slow, depending on you know, the, the, the amount that you work with it and, and 
and that the pulse, uh, as it were, drives the vocal cavity. And I think that, that that breaking apart of the impulse from the resonance structure, obviously the guero also has a resonant character, and each guero sounds different. And this is a particularly wonderful one, and he's very worried because it's cracked, and he just you know, dreads the idea that's, that it breaks at some point, which it might. Um, so, yeah, no, I definitely feel that. In, in the case of, of Still, the first voice bass piece, the, the, the glottal clicks originally came because I needed a pulse that would allow a sequencer to reposition the sounds. So there are, there are patterns that there's a 16 position pattern that goes, that plays through the whole thing. So you go And the pattern is always the same, but the, the spacing of the clicks determines how rapidly a move is instantiated. So that was, I knew that I could get those clicks to register as pulses. And that was the original idea. And then it turned out that the, you know, the, the glottal clicks had a lot more functionality than I had originally thought. Uh, speaking of spatialization, you mentioned earlier, like uh, the spatialization of text acting is like uh, clarifying agents through localization. But you seem to also say in the article that like the movement frequently in justice and talking about justice uh, that also like accentuated other parameters and things we look to. For me, could you elaborate on that? It seems like. Well, yeah. I think that uh, I've, I've moved back and forth between using the word uh, calligraphy and choreography because if you watch uh, films, which there, there are some interesting, uh, certainly videos now, of uh, the brush with a master calligrapher, mm -hmm. you see that it's, it's a dance. And the spread of the brush is very much like the skirt, you know, of, of, a, of a dancer, and and the way that uh, the way the density and the spread and the pressure and the mark that's left uh, correspond to meaning is is very deep. And of course, it, we can't directly um, transfer that to cursive English because it's a completely different kind of language with different purposes and, and different methodologies. But that when you watch uh, a calligrapher do cursive uh, Chinese or, or Japanese kanji and so on, you can see the, the degree to which it has well, for example, any time you want to make a downward stroke, you have to start by going sideways into it. In other words, you initiate any vertical stroke with a horizontal beginning, and any horizontal stroke is initiated with a vertical beginning. So there are all kinds of little sort of choreographic details. And I think that I, <coughs> I like most uh, choreography because it suggests the way in which dance uh, manifests not only emotion, but also sometimes uh, dramaturgy, the interaction between uh, dancers or the interaction between a dancer and an imagined other or an imagined scene and so on. Uh, I mean, the Gucci's uh, sculpture for Martha Graham's company in the early days was really amazing, and I think it had a big impact on Merce Cunningham. So uh, I, I, I guess that I don't have a formula. I have a, a kind of emotional investment in what kind of movement is appropriate to what kind of purposes. And I don't, I don't think that I could describe it in any explicit way. Well, there's a concert in 15 minutes. I think we have to stop. Thank you so much.